welcome, welcome back everyone to University of Washington of Tacoma's Redefining American Labor Lecture Series. This is part of our campus's Labor Solidarity Project, which has been made possible through the generous funding of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies of Seattle. And that is officially the first time I have made all the plugs that I should have been making throughout all of these intros, which must of course mean that we're, we're approaching the conclusion of our seminar series. Uh, and I'm delighted tonight to welcome two South Sound educators to come in and share their experiences uh, at the local level. And I think provide a bit of local context um, to the larger hashtag red for ed movement at the national level. And that is, um, for those of you who had a chance to check out Eric Blanc's Red State Revolt uh, prior to tonight's lecture, uh, you will understand that this is a, you know, this is nothing if not a bipartisan movement. Um, we had, we were fortunate to have Eric Blanc here last year. Uh, we had a great talk and uh, we, we sort of, the, the refrain there was we wish we had teachers involved in that talk. And now this year we've got teachers but we've got no Eric. So uh, hopefully next year we're gonna tie it all together. We can bring everybody back. Uh, so uh, for tonight's topic, I have to admit as an educator, I am uh, of course sort of selfishly invested in this topic, uh, but that's not, not, that's not the only reason our guests are with us tonight. Um, you know, over the last nine weeks, we've covered a ton of ground. Uh, we've talked to journalists, we've talked to economists, labor organizers, legal scholars, historians, filmmakers. We've talked to historians who are also filmmakers. Um, but I think we've been sort of missing one crucial angle, which is, uh, you know, rank and file, boots on the ground, actual union members, uh, people who don't people who, well, I should say people who do study labor history, but don't necessarily need to study labor history um, to come up with an analysis of our contemporary labor moment because they're actually living it. Uh, and I think that their experiences and their insights are incredibly valuable. Um, and they do, you know, with this perspective, we get a fuller picture of the state of American labor. Uh, and I think that the, the, the history that they're currently living is it's exciting and it's it's very inspiring. Um, Jane McLevy has identified education as kind of one of the driving forces behind labor's recent resurgence. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen it in red state revolts, if you had a chance to check that out. These are the, you know, supposedly red states of West Virginia, Oklahoma, and Arizona. Uh, teachers there just saying enough is enough um, and making the case that, you know, uh, that, that, that working conditions directly relate to learning conditions. And then when we short change, when we short change our teachers, we're also shortchanging our, our children and our students. And I think that we've, you know, we've seen that here in our state too. And I think that what we've seen uh, is that when, when people get organized and they fight, they win. <laughs> so, so I'm really hoping tonight to learn a little bit more about how to get organized, how to fight and how to win from our guests. And so joining us tonight, we have uh, Megan Little, who is a high school social studies teacher and a union officer who's joining us from North Thurston Public Schools. And we also have Katie Van Etten, who's a middle school teacher and a building rep who was recently elected to Uniserve at large position, who's joining us from the Franklin Pierce District. So I wanted, uh, on behalf of UWT and behalf of the Labor Solidarity Project, I wanted again, to, just to thank you for being with us tonight. Um, the conversation is, is gonna be a little more free flowing for the, for the audience members who've been to the rest of the seminar. Um, we've prepared some questions. As always, students have submitted questions ahead of time and I've kind of worked them into some of the questions I wanted to uh, to raise at some point, uh, but I think we can also just kind of let the conversation lead us where it wants to lead us. But I thought maybe you know logical place to start would be just kind of uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, how you got into the profession in the first place, and maybe um, you know as we start to think about some of the uh, the, the 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 realities of the teaching workplace, how how your vision of teaching has evolved over your years as educators. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I, um, when I was growing up, like I never ever thought I would be a teacher. <laughs> um, and um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after school. I like went to college to just study things that I was interested in and it was like a terrible decision but 
um, just because it was expensive. <laughs> but uh, I ended up um, after school, I graduated in 2008 and it was like right at the middle of like the housing crisis that happened. And so I ended up um, working for AmeriCorps for a couple of years and the um, nonprofit organization that hosted my team um, was up in Seattle, Solid Ground, and they did like really good um, anti-racism work and training like alongside the work we were doing through AmeriCorps. And so it really was for me like um, a big eye opener to be looking at like race and racism and the school system and like seeing how institutions um, perpetuated racism and how like teachers and other school personnel um, played like the roles as gatekeepers, like within education. And um, that really inspired me and made me want to really think about what role I could play in like education. And so I went to school again to get my uh, master in teaching and kind of like haven't looked back, I guess. Um, for me, like being a teacher has been really about um, like thinking about power, thinking about privilege. Um, because I teach social studies, I've been able to do as much as I possibly can to incorporate like big questions like that uh, within my teaching. And also I teach middle school. So it's like this weird time in students' lives where they're figuring out kind of like more who they are and like kind of how they want to be in the world. And so they're really open to like thinking about those big ideas and um, really discussing those with their peers. So um, for me, like becoming a teacher, like was, it was like, I immediately signed up to be part of the union. <laughs> I knew I wanted to be uh, in a, a unionized profession um, just for a long time. I don't know why necessarily, but um, it was just always something that was really important to me. And so being able to be part of the union the whole time I've been an educator has been really amazing. I've been able to see how collective bargaining and being able to um, like uh, advocate for myself and my colleagues has like changed my working conditions. So it's been really powerful. Uh, yeah. so you, you sort of arrived at the workplace with kind of a, a sort of a social justice education critique already. Yeah, that's always been really important to me too. And that's actually something I've really um, been uh, really excited about uh, the WEA um, there. I feel like I've found like my cadre of people that are like-minded within the union specifically. And um, we have done um, like anti-racism trainings, um, culturally responsive classroom management trainings across the state. And it's kind of like grown over the past couple of years. And now the folks who were originally the ones to conceive of that training have been trying to figure out how to share that with other states as well. So, yeah. Excellent. Uh, well, my uh, entry into teaching is, is quite different. Um, I grew up in Idaho, so not a very uh, heavily unionized state at all. And I had very little experience. Uh, no, not very little. I had zero experience with unions at all um, growing up. And I was a very disciplined and motivated student and kind of like set my eyes on the prize. And to me, that was teaching. It um, always felt like a part of who I was and part of what I was meant to do. And I always felt like in some aspect of my life, I was an educator. And so I went straight to college, got my teaching degree right away um, at 22, and I thought I was going to set out teaching motivated and disciplined students who were really passionate about learning, just like me, um, and that was an incredibly naive perspective to have, but I mean, that's kind of, you 
go through life lessons and you learn things. And um, unexpectedly, just kind of by happenstance, my first teaching job was in Yakima. Um, and I was radicalized as an educator by my experience teaching in um, a community that is uh, just inundated with so many different problems. And I do want to take a minute and express solidarity with the apple packer workers who are on strike in Yakima right now, uh, an incredibly marginalized community who are right toward the beginning of the uh, food supply chain and who are facing really, really uh, poor working conditions when it comes to response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and they're not unionized workers. So I uh, just want to take a minute to <laughs> express solidarity with them. Um, and immediately when I began my career, I realized that everything I thought teaching was, was wrong. And what teaching actually is, is um, helping students develop as people and to learn what they're passionate about and to I also teach social studies, so to think about things in an internationalist perspective and to think about what their roles and responsibilities are to their community and looking at the different systems that operate in this country and in this world and the ways that those systems benefit some people at the expense of others and how to dismantle those systems. And um, so I was completely just blindsided by uh, the actual experience of teaching um, and I owe so much of that to my experience that I had in Yakima and um, I got involved in the union my second year of teaching um, also kind of by happenstance where I was working at a very small school and the person who um, was the the building representative for the union in my school I uh, was getting his administrative credentials and was going to be an administrative intern and he saw it as kind of a conflict of interest to continue as the building representative. And so he asked me to do it. And as most first year teachers do, I said yes to everything that came along. And I took on <laughs> that responsibility as well. And then as I got more involved in the union and thought about um, what it meant to be in solidarity with one another, and what it meant for it to be in solidarity with other working class people and then realize that that's really what I'm trying to teach my students is how to be in solidarity with one another when they're facing all sorts of different um, barriers to living the lives that they want to live. And so um, when I moved to Tacoma, I, I teach in North Thurston, but I live in Tacoma. When I moved over here, I immediately continued my role as a building representative and um, kind of was probably one of the loudest, rowdiest rank and file educators in the in the local and then um, kind of leveraged that into a position on the executive board eventually. And so I've been trying to continue um, building power as a as a local and thinking about the ways that we leverage the power for both um, the workers in our bargaining unit, but also what it means to use our position of power to um, benefit our students. And like Alex said earlier, um, teaching conditions are learning conditions and thinking about how we create the space in which students can become the, the people that they are most meant to become and the people that the world needs them to become. Nice. Can, you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Just the, the, I, I feel like I, I experienced a similar sort of evolution in my, uh, my, my understanding of what what's teaching would be like versus the realities, which basically hit me day one of my student teaching experience. Um, it wasn't quite as dead poet society as I thought it would be. Um, but I, I'm curious to know, uh, what would you say in terms of additional responsibilities that, that you've had to take on as, you know, because teaching isn't just sort of delivering the curriculum, right? And I feel like you, you've both already kind of spoken to, um, you know, the, the, the fact that as educators, you sort of, um, you take it upon yourself to sort of, you know, really shape individuals. But, but I mean, there's, there's more than that too, right? I'm curious to know sort of where where the union comes in in terms of uh, sort of warding off some of those 
sort of, oh, by the way, can you do this? Oh, by the way, uh, you need to get these kids on the buses. Oh, by the way, you need to do, you know. I mean, like, I think that um, the union, like, I appreciate knowing already the things that I have to say no to. <laughs> Like that's really helpful. And and the union has helped to outline those things um, partially, right? So like, like you mentioned, like bus duty, lunch duty, playground duty, like there are things that my contract protects me from doing and therefore like tries to protect my time, which is great. Um, but I have definitely found that even with that in place, like I have been, like out of my seven years of teaching, I think I've had one year where I wasn't like actively continuing to advocate for myself and my colleagues and push back against administrators. Um, because I do think that, um, you know, like there's just like a disconnect between the demands of like the daily demands of like being in the classroom and teaching um, and, I've never been an administrator, so I'm not sh sure what their entire role is, but um, yeah, so I, I, I do like even right now, like we're doing distance learning and I've been um, in a big push with my principal on like, what are the expectations for teachers who have kids and are like full time teaching right now and also full time parenting right now without childcare. Um, and I have some colleagues on my grade level team um, who are, they happen to be married and they're both teaching and they have two kids under the age of four. So, you know, we're like really thinking about like um, what is like convenient for administrators, what's convenient for our school to function versus like what's necessary for working conditions, what's like necessary for us to be able to mitigate the different demands that we have within the job. Because you're right, it's not just delivering content, it's also um, writing content and like figuring out how to, I mean like I have a friend who says like 50% of your curriculum walks in the door on the first day. So you know what you're teaching and you know like the different points you're gonna make along the way, but especially with um, like the younger, I don't know, maybe this is an experience you've shared, Megan, but like with middle school, I feel like so much of my job is like trying to engage them in the content and trying to like find like what are the things that they're passionate about and interested in and how can I help them see the threads of those things in the curriculum so it's I don't think I've ever like retaught something the same way over again in multiple years um, even when I've had like the same classes I've tweaked it based on who is showing up and like who is in my class and what cultures and experiences they're bringing. So it's that, it's also like the teacher evaluation system. Like I've had completely different experiences in each of the different districts I've worked in. Um, but for the most part, it's a lot of work, um, like proving the things that you're already doing, just needing to like keep track of like, like it's not just like contacting families and um, about various things, but it's like keeping a record of those things. And like, I talked with this parent on this day about this and this was the response. So that I can like prove to my administrator that I'm doing those things. So that's one of those things that I really, <laughs> like that irks me about teaching is like feeling like I, like, you know, maybe we'll get into this a little bit later, but just the nature of like the history of teaching and that it's always been like a female dominated profession and like what respect or lack of respect comes with that and always feeling like there's a microscope and that like if there's something wrong within education, teachers have to do something to prove that they're not the problem somehow. So mm -hmm that's been like an interesting weird dynamic to like mitigate and I'm thankful for the union to support that process because 
it is really like even even the colleagues I've worked with who have had negative experiences with evaluation, there are processes that we can go through to like make sure that their perspective is included with the evaluation that they receive and those kind of things. So yeah, it's like I cannot imagine being a teacher without a union <laughs> like so many of our colleagues in other parts of the country. So <laughs> there's something that Katie brings up that um along those lines that I want to talk about and it's um the amount of care work that goes along with being an educator and that's something that I think a lot of people who go into teaching aren't necessarily prepared for until they meet their possibly 150 students with a wide variety of needs and um there's a reason why even today I know there's the historical reason why women have tended to be teachers but there's also this this aspect of being a caretaker for possibly incredibly vulnerable incredibly uh, broken fragile kids and you become this this um in some cases a role model in some cases just a, an ear to to listen to and those are all non quantifiable responsibilities of an educator you can't opt out of being a caretaker if you want to become an educator and there's a dynamic in education where uh, something like 80% of uh, K-12 teachers in the country are women. But when you look at building administration and district administration, it's like 14%. And so you have people who don't have any experience or who haven't had experience um, in a classroom in possibly a long time, um, who are predominantly male, evaluating, as Katie brought up, and making decisions for how um, predominantly women run their classrooms or how well they run their classrooms. And it um, is something that, like Katie said, if you can't put it down on paper, then did you really do it? And how do we know that you are working? What, what qualifies as work is all uh, really, ambiguous and it's actually really highlighted it there's been a spotlight on this particular issue during the closure where um we had our administration try to argue that well we didn't really start working until april 13th and so we need to get into issues of pay and the length of the school year because we weren't working that whole time and and they they said it as if it was just a matter of fact this isn't something we need to argue. We didn't give you any professional responsibilities until April 13th, so you weren't doing anything until April 13th. But <laughs> as you can probably imagine, during that time, we're calling parents, we're emailing students, we're holding uh, online calls with kids so that they feel some sort of connection to a community that was suddenly ripped away from them. I hand wrote a hundred cards that I sent out to students just to let them know I'm thinking about them and they can keep it up through the end of the year. And none of that is required of the job, but it's part of what makes you an educator. Mm -hmm. And um, having the ability to come together as a union and say, no, we, this is the work we do. And maybe you don't know because you're not in the classroom and you don't spend time with kids, but this is part of being a teacher and it's not optional. Yes. So. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 I know as, as a, as a parent of three Tacoma public school students, my, we were in constant contact for those first couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think, uh, I mean, they, my, my children's, they're, they're, Teachers are amazing. They always work hard, but I don't think they've ever worked as hard as they've worked at the sort of initial outset of the uh, the pandemic and just sort of navigating the confusion. Um, yeah, that's that's just insane. I didn't realize that I knew the the numbers were pretty stark. I didn't realize the the breakdown in terms of uh, teachers versus ad versus admin was that pronounced. Um, but I do know. I mean, we also have problems with sort of racial disparities in terms of. Our educators not sort of fully reflecting, uh, you know, the composition of their classes. I, I did want to circle back to that that notion of care work. Um, just because I think it's fascinating, and it is it's a way to think of teaching alongside other categories of labor that get sort of roped into this, like, oh, you know, it's not it's not just a job; it's a calling, or it's a calling that also, you know, is a job, and. Um, 
it seems to sort of lend itself to really like a, you know a, 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 a unique exploitability right <laughs> you can sort of present these people as like why do we have to pay these teachers so much they're doing what they love to do i mean never don't even get me started on the summer thing but just like just focusing on like the the notion of um yeah, care work and it being specifically, like, as you say, you know, uh, you know, historically um, and continually uh, categorized as a type of gendered profession. I'm curious to know, um, you know, you've talked a little bit about disparities between uh, teachers and administrators. Uh, in terms of union leadership, do you, are, are, are the numbers similar? Do you feel like, um, you know, those are those are sort of organizations that lend themselves to sort of a more representative representative body. Well, WEA actually has some policies around representation in union leadership. Um, basically, so WEA, for those of you who don't know, is the Washington Education Association, and it's the statewide union for um, public school educators in the state of Washington. And it includes, in some school districts, paraeducators, office professionals. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's other groups too that are slipping my mind right now. Um, and part of the- Psychologist, nurses. Yes, yes. So other uh, educational- um, Support professionals. Yeah, yeah, and the ESA, but I can't remember what it stands for. But my point is, uh, within the bylaws of the WA Constitution, there is stipulations that the representation on uh, in your representative council, which is basically the um, decision making body for the local association and for the executive board, which is the leadership of the local association, has to be equal to or exceed the representation in the school district. And that, of course, doesn't get at the problem of um, education or public school districts struggling to attract and retain educators of color. And that is a really uh, big issue. And um, our schools are not, our school staff are not representative of our school uh, students. In most cases, it's definitely not in my school district, but at the very least, in union leadership at the local level, there is a rule that says that it has to be representative. And if it's not, and this happened in my, in my local association this year, um, we made, we created new positions and we had educator of color at large positions to our leadership bodies so that we were making sure to be more representative. Um, and that, that really comes down to race and ethnicity, and I'm not sure about gender, but I mean, we know that certain types of personalities and people are attracted to positions of power and tend to go after those positions of power sometimes. I would say that like my experiences, um, I, I've worked in three different districts over my years of teaching and they've all like every single time my um, union president has been a woman and, and to be clear, a white woman. Um, and I would say, I do feel like the, um, like the union um, represent, representatives are way more um, proportional to like the, at least the gender breakdown um, within the teaching profession, um, as opposed to like what Megan was saying earlier about administrators. Um, but yeah, we definitely have a lot of work to do still on that. Um, I've been really happy to see that there are, there seem to be more unions, at least particularly in this area that are making sure they have um, like an equity team in particular, or they have um, minority, minority at large, um, or um, minority representative. I think like the word choice is really awkward, but um, yeah, I, I think like our unions are 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 going to be the institutions that are going to push that work. I don't think that's going to come from the district. I don't think that's going to come from um, like the folks who are necessarily like running the schools. So I'm happy to be on that, that end or whatever of like the side of 
the folks who are pushing for that. So. Nice. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hearing what sounds like incredibly progressive, uh, you know, stances being adopted by uh, union here, but I, I'm wondering if there's, is this a, um, are, are, are we sort of currently witnessing what do you think, maybe like a changing of the guard? Is this, uh, you know, sort of union imagining its, its work extending beyond the school parking lot, right? Like the idea that, um, that, that, that teachers perform a much larger role within their communities. And I'm kind of curious, because I, um, hearing, hearing you all talk about uh, testing and sort of data-driven results brought, I guess, flashbacks to memories I had when I taught high school back in Connecticut, and then I taught for a year out here, and it was like completely different systems of data tracking but equally traumatic in terms of like, you know, this, this crisis of gathering the data and proving that I was working, even though I was exhausted from working all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious to know whether uh, when you, you know, being part of two teaching unions uh, on, on both coasts, at least in my experience, what I observed was a real clash. Uh, and, I, and I mean, I, I don't want to sound ageist, but it did sort of break down roughly along generational lines um, between people who who were interested in sort of, um, you know, taking a more conservative approach to bargaining uh, and sort of safeguarding, honestly, their material interests, and then sort of uh, another group of people, uh, more insurgent, who were sort of more interested in sort of reimagining what the profession itself looked like and how the profession um, you know, interacts with the public and, and was, yes, interested in sort of material uh, conditions too, but, but it, it was more of a, um, more sort of heady conversations about equity, diversity, and inclusion and things like that. Are you all uh, witnessing something similar in, in I see Katie's not yes. here. <laughs> I mean, I guess like I would say that I, so I feel like I've totally know what you're talking about as far as like when you said the phrase like the changing of the guard like that's definitely something that's happening and um, I used to work in Tacoma Public Schools and that was like so it's a much bigger district than where I'm currently working um, and uh, so there's therefore like a much bigger union as well and so um, there were like major pockets within that union of folks who are more like like old school, like want to bargain for bread and butter and want to have like clearly defined like working conditions outlined in the contract. Um, and then there are, is like this other side of folks who um, want to be more progressive and want to bargain for the social good. Um, and like, I think that there are like, like movements in bigger cities like um, UTLA, Chicago, um, Bay Area, like they have some like really good concrete examples of bargaining for the social good and trying to make sure that their contract is including language that is um, like understanding like what you're talking about, understanding that education has such such a huge impact on the community because every kid goes to school and so thinking about how and you know Megan said this before and you also said this before too Alex that like our working conditions are students learning conditions and that's like always been a phrase I've heard like within every bargain and contract and everything like that comes up all the time um, but like what's really unique and cool about that is that it means that like it's really like it's really cool to be in a profession where the community like sees the work we're doing like with nursing like the community sees the work that you're doing and i think that that's harder sometimes on um in maybe some places where you're not like directly or your family isn't being directly impacted by those professions so, but um, I know like when we, um, sorry, I feel like I'm kind of going on a tangent, but when we had the strike, I was in Tacoma when we had the strike back in 2018 and our community like rallied around us and 
we really, there was this like conversation going on internally on like pushing for what was going on at the time was the, the McCleary money and making sure that that money went where it was supposed to go, which it had been um, flagged to go into teacher pay increases. And so it was supposed to go into there and the district was really pushing back against it. And so um, we had so much community support around us, which was incredible, but we were also, I mean, it wasn't a full bargain contract, like it wasn't a full open negotiation at that time. So we were just um, working on the McCleary money and we were just working on um, getting that money put into our pay. But um, we were starting to have that conversation on like, what is our role in the community and how can we bargain for the social good? And like, what are the things that we need to be thinking about? and and how can we push for those things? And, you know, like the other, like I mentioned, these other cities in the country that have pushed for like green spaces and have pushed for housing and have pushed for all these really powerful good things, which I think are like ultimately good for the whole community. Um, so I, yeah, I, I definitely have seen the, the two like almost like dichotomous like viewpoints and how those have come together so I agree with everything Katie's saying and I want to go back to the the sort of uh, intergenerational divide that you kind of uh, alluded to earlier and um I think what this gets at I mean younger people we can look at trends tend to be more progressive or liberal than older people and they might be willing to go after some things that are a little bit uh, more out of the box and and uh, progressive taking more progressive stances, um, but at the same time, I think there's an ongoing uh, need for internal and external organizing to be able to achieve um, some of these things. That just because you have you may have um, an older uh, union, or just because you might have um, some people who are mo more focused on bread and butter issues or just contract negotiations or who are maybe even unsure about how much the union supports them. I see all of that as an organizing issue. And it's not just something that, that you're stuck with until people get older and retire, but it's, it's something that can actually be dealt with through an organizing strategy where you have conversations with the people that you work with and you learn about what's important to them and what would be important for them uh, if their, their kids were still in school and what they would want for their students and uh, the role that the schools play in an entire community and how when people leave school, what impact do you want them to have on the community? And so what do we, how do we need to treat students while they're in school? And that's all internal where you're talking to members in your union and you're, getting them to see how all of these issues play together and why bargaining for the common good really is for the common good, including uh, them, um, but also in the community. And there's things that you can do that are really uh, obvious, like um, when you see unions using their leverage to um, support um, specific community issues, um, but at the same time, you have to have organizing in the community when there's issues that you're fighting for that are not directly for the common good or not as easily seen as for the common good, like what Katie was talking about in 2018, when it really was all about pay raises. Mm -hmm. And there are some places where you might be where it's really hard to get the community to see why paying teachers more money directly benefits kids. And it takes more... Uh, relationships built within the community and with other community organizations to get people on in involved because uh, Tacoma had a lot of support around its strike but that's not always the case um, especially as you brought up with educators where people are saying um, they should do it out of the goodness of their own heart or this strike is hurting kids and there's I mean we all know those common refrains and so um, we're constantly in a state of organizing and um, so that when those crises come up, both the, the union is prepared, but the community is prepared as well. Yeah, I, I distinctly remember 2018 um, and being really, really surprised by the amount of, of local support uh, for, the, for that strike. And I remember we had uh, Angel Morton came in last spring 
to talk to my intro to labor studies students. We were talking beforehand and um, and I just, it was actually a week or two after Eric Blanc was on campus. So we were kind of, I was working to kind of like try to contextualize the, you know, the Tacoma strike within this larger wave wave of uh, activism. And, and she was like, uh, no, no, this was, this was just about salary. It's kind of like, oh, like that's, that's, I mean, it's amazing that so many people, uh, you know, came out to bat for the teachers here in Tacoma. It was really Really inspiring. I mean, I I I walked the line uh, at the district and over in Proctor. It was, I mean, it was a really sort of formative experience. And I'm kind of curious to know a little bit more about um, because because we have you here. And uh, and again, uh, you know, while we've hosted people who've who've studied studied sort of labor history at a at a distance or sort of theorized about it. Um, can you talk? I know Megan, you mentioned you you didn't actually go on strike in 2018, right? No. Can I tell a quick story? Sure, yeah. I want to hear like what okay. the, because uh, I taught in public schools for uh, seven years and we never, we never did anything. It's very disappointing. So in 2018, I was a rank and file teacher. Um, I did participate on, on the representative council, but I wasn't in the executive board. And uh, we were actually in the middle of a full open. So that means that every piece of our contract is being bargained. And as everybody knows, there were strikes popping up all across uh, the state and especially in Southeast Washington. Um, and Washington Education Association has something like 96,000 members. It's a massive statewide union, um, but there's like three organizers for the state. And so the WA staff was tapped out. They were so busy. And so if you were not on strike, you didn't have people from WEA there. And the last time that my school district had gone on strike was in the early 90s. So there were very few people even within my own local association who had any experience with strikes at all. And so as it starts um, getting closer to going on strike, we, the, you hear the conversation start to, to bubble up. And especially as more and more school districts go out on strike, um, there's conversations all over the place happening. Rallies are getting bigger. Sign waving is getting bigger. Um, there's social media campaigns. And um, suddenly, um, so I, I started out as, as something called bargaining support. And bargaining support means you bring water bottles and snacks to the bargaining team and you cheer them on and you, you want both sides to come to the table in good faith and bargain together. And that's what bargaining support is. But really bargaining support is a way to have sort of a structure in place for when things go bad. And so since I was on bargaining support, when things started to go bad, I uh, became the strike coordinator for our district. Um, and so I get a phone call um, from a WA uh, union rep, um, Randy Paddock, and he says, okay, so you're gonna go on strike on Monday and here's the plan and this is what you're gonna do and this is what you have to prepare between now, it's Thursday, to Monday. And I just kind of sat there wide-eyed because last I knew we were still bargaining. But if WA is calling you on the phone, it means you're going on strike. And so our executive board and bargaining team were all bargaining and we had um, representatives from all the different buildings meet in our very, very small union office and we, and it's, I mean, it's August, so it's 100 degrees, and we planned out what the strike would look like. And we had, we were, we were saying, tell your staff that when they, um, when they come home or when they leave work tomorrow, that they should be prepared not to go back for an extended period of time. So get whatever you need out of there. And um, we had a whole structure in place where I was the, the coordinator for the association. And then there was a zone captain for each of the three zones. And then each building had a picket captain that was, and so it's like this chain of communication from uh, the bargaining team to me, to the zone captains, to the uh, picket captains on each of the picket lines. And in 48 hours, I'm trying to learn everything I can about, um, how to run a strike because there's nobody from WA to be able to uh, help us. And we finish up this meeting and we walk downstairs and our union president is downstairs in our union building and he says, we have a tentative agreement. And so <laughs> it's like we had all of this anticipation built up and then suddenly it was like gone. 
And in a way, I think most of us in that room, and there were probably about 50 of us there, felt a little disappointed. And only because we had built up all of this solidarity and uh, excitement, and we were so passionate about this and inspired by so many of our other colleagues across the state that we were ready to do it. And um, so while I'm really grateful that we didn't have to go out on strike, because I know that is a huge strain on uh, the union members, their families, kids in the district, et cetera, um, we, were, we were ready and excited. Did you, did you get the deal you were looking for? Uh, we did, yeah, we actually got a good contract. Um, part of what helped us is we held out for a while, not as long as Tumwater. So our school district, Tumwater and Olympia are all kind of uh, in the same area. And so our district often looks to what contracts in the surrounding area are. And Olympia, frankly, settled for a poor contract when they settled pretty early on and they didn't involve their membership in much of the, um, the sort of planning process leading up to it. And so the membership was pretty disappointed. So you have Olympia on one side and then Tumwater actually going out on strike just like Tacoma on the other and we were kind of in the middle. Interesting. Yeah, I remember with, with Tacoma, that was part of it too where the, the numbers just didn't add up. It was like we, you know, the teachers in Tacoma were getting paid substantially less than everyone else in the surrounding area. And there was this money. I feel like the the you know the teachers union did a good job of sort of explaining the narrative, um, which which allowed for them to 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 sort of pull off a salary based strike, uh, just because it it seemed ridiculous that our teachers weren't getting paid as much. So Katie, think, can you, can you I, yeah, that? I think that was actually something that was really key to us winning though too is like being really like clear about the, everything with the community, like like what you're saying, Alex, because like there were a lot of people that had questions and there were a lot of people that were like pushing back. And we did hear the, the rhetoric of like those greedy teachers, you know, and not just from community, but from the district as well. Like the district was putting out um, articles and like public statements saying that like, oh, we just don't have the money for this. Like we need to be able to use the money for other things. And um, I think like, so if I'm going to talk about my experience on the strike, I was, a building rep at the time and um, in the school uh, I worked at, I was one of, we could have had five building reps and there were just two of us. And so we both became strike captains out of just like necessity to coordinate our whole building. And um, I will say that like, kind of similar to like what Megan was saying, like the decision that our, when our union decided to go on strike it was electric. Like we, I felt like on fire. Like I went home and like watched the newsies and like those couple Simpsons episodes and you know, like all of these things because I felt like, yeah, like this is our time to, to really push for what's right. And I was really excited about it at first. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just remember seeing that video that w went viral on Facebook. Where was it? Lincoln High School, everybody was crammed into the gym. And you know, the, oh no, it was uh, Mount Tahoma High School. Yeah. And it, well, I mean, people yeah. were nuts. I mean, it was like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about watching that video now. Yeah, and it was like crazy to be in that room. And I have to say that, like, it was also like that strike was like the thing I didn't anticipate is how emotionally exhausting it was because every single day we were like trying to see, like, did this work? Like, what have we heard from district? Like, what is our strategy? Um, and morale was another thing that, um, not at my school, but I was hearing from friends across the district that there was really low morale in different parts of the district. Um, and so our union, um, I really liked the strategy that we eventually came up with right at the very beginning. Everyone was um, like marching and picketing in their like school neighborhood areas so that they were like really visible. We were really visible all across the city. Um, but for whatever reason, at some schools, there was really low morale and there were a lot of people, and I'm not sure if it was just like, kind of like the rhetoric um, that folks have shared before of like those greedy teachers and the, the rhetoric that the district was putting out and, um, you know, like, oh, you have the whole summer, you know, like they're, and, you know, thinking about like, 
school not in session means that my the kids with free and reduced price lunch aren't eating and you know thinking about like we're now behind in the school year and how are we going to get caught up when we already have um some learning deficits particularly in different pockets around the district and so um there was a like a lot of that to push against and you know like everybody has an opinion about teaching like whether or not you like went to school a long time ago or recently or you went to private school or public school like everyone has experienced school in some form or, or another so even just like being at the grocery store and like wearing my like red shirt that said like support Tacoma teachers would immediately start up conversations um and at first it was like exciting because it was like oh i wanted to i had my like elevator speech and my talking points and i wanted to like win people over and then toward the end of it i was just exhausted and then we started the school year so that was just like an interesting dynamic that i never anticipated but yeah we we at my building just tried to oh and i'll i'll say like the the strategy like morphed so later at the beginning, we were all at our own individual work sites. And then later on, we had coordinated these days where like the different um, like boundaries, like the different school, I don't, I can't think of the right word, but like the high school boundary where like all of these elementary and middle school students go to this one high school, we would take days where like the different high school zones would like come together and march around the district office. And that was like really energizing, being there with so many people and like everyone had signs and was marching and there was loud music. Um, and there were a couple of days we had where like everyone was at the district offices and those were like really amazing to be a part of. And, and I do have to say that like, it was also really cool to see like folks from other unions came out and marched with us and park picketed with us like and um i don't know like that was really cool to see and like lots of community members came out eventually our strategy ended up turning into being more focused on kind of like pulling in the community and kind of like making sure that we had control of like the narrative and um i don't know how many folks here remember this like super specifically, but there was like this article that came out and one of the folks who worked in the finance office of the district had retired and, and said that there was like some like fiscal discrepancy that they were really um, like, I don't know, like there had been like some weirdness going on and like that came out and that was like a huge boost to our, our push and our cause and um like so we got media on board we got i mean like we were constantly churning out social media things as well like i know um like me personally and all of my colleagues in my building we were constantly trying to like make posts um online for why it was important what was our intention um that we wanted to go back to teaching um to just try to like make sure that the community was really clear of like what our intention was with it because it was you know like there were a lot of people that were pushing back and it, that wasn't the loudest voice fortunately but there were people that were pushing back quite a bit so um yeah i mean we also at my specific school site like i like i did americorps before teaching like i had mentioned so i have lots of experience in making donation calls so i like got like people came out and donated a bunch of ice cream to us people came out with like a food truck and like sold lunch to us um there were like tons of people that came out and marched with us so i don't know i i think as long as we had that support on our side we felt like we could do anything and we could like really push for what we wanted um but yeah there there was a lot of it it was just hard and just exhausting like not physically exhausting like marching and walking around isn't like much more than walking around the classroom but just kind of like not knowing what was going to happen not knowing if we were going to have an impact on the decisions not knowing if the district was going to bargain with us there was so much there, the other thing is there's so many rumors and like so much like going on that 
um, we didn't all, we weren't fully like in the know about because the, the union was trying to be intentional with wanting to communicate with us, but not wanting to like show all of their cards. So, you know, like that was hard to mitigate as well. Just trying to make sure that like, we like kept people coming and like being engaged, but um, yeah, I don't know. So. Katie, you bring up a really important point um, that I don't think a lot of people really think about when they're not educators. And it's that I, I believe more than any other profession, people feel like they deserve to have a say in the working conditions of teachers. And to some extent, they have a point where like, it might be their children that we're teaching and they want to make sure that their uh, children are, are going to school in a really positive environment. But there's also this other side, and this has to do with being a, a public sector worker too, where people think that they pay property taxes, so they pay my salary, so they should in a sense be my employer and determine my working conditions and that's actually a tool used by the freedom foundation and other anti-union organizations across the country where what they try to do is they try to open up contract negotiations to include community members so instead of just the union and the district being at the table community members would get to have their say too and the people who are trying to pry the contracts open for this are not the kind of people who are trying to lift us up and, and support us in everything we're trying to do. They're trying to do the exact opposite. And so um, there's this strange like ownership issue over our own work where um, it's like we're, we're constantly having to, to justify our positions and justify not only what we teach, but what we ask for at the bargaining table, what we do on the weekends, what we do during the summertime, how late we sleep in the day. It's like every aspect of life is a little bit more scrutinized because people feel that um, I, that they, they deserve to have input. Um, and I, I can see what you're getting at when you're talking about going around the community and then taking on that emotional labor of having to like, constantly justify the actions of the union um or even just the actions of, of your own self um it, it's something pretty unique to education so so what would you say i mean what 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 advice would you have for community members who want to be sort of better allies to the teachers who want to support the union um what what, what should we be doing Um, I think that like, you know, like every community is going to be different. And so, I mean, and I used to work in Tacoma, but I don't now. I currently work in Franklin Pierce. And so like, I would say like, if you want to support the educators in your community, like talk to the educators in your community. And um, I mean, like for us, like, during our strike, like it was amazing the amount of support we were getting. Um, but there were also, again, like people that had really negative opinions. Um, and I mean, like, I, I do think like kind of like what Megan is talking about with um, the Freedom Foundation and how they're, the, how they're trying to like push this idea that like community members should be involved in the contract negotiation, which is totally insane. Like, like if you've never been a teacher, like experiencing education as a student is really different than experiencing education as a teacher. Um, and like, I remember like being a student and thinking like, uh, I don't know, like I remember criticizing, like internally criticizing my teachers, like how hard could your job be? You teach the same thing every year. Like, I don't know. I just, I remember thinking that as a student and you know, let alone like there are folks who feel that way and they're adults and have lots of power. <laughs> so um, I don't know, I guess I would say that like, just talk with the teachers in your community and like see what battles or struggles are going on for them and like ask them how you can support them. Like that's gonna be different no matter like wherever you live, um, there's gonna be different things that they're trying to push for or whatever. Um, in Franklin Pierce right now, like our school district is 100% free and reduced rate, which means 100% um, of our students uh, pay a reduced rate or have a free um, entitlement to the lunch and breakfast programs that we offer at our school. And those are specifically for 
um, families that are high poverty. And so that means that 100% of my students are like qualify within high poverty. And so like the biggest thing that we're constantly trying to work toward and advocate for within our community is making sure that our students and their families have food um, like over the weekend, um, during this whole closure, um, we work really closely with a, like our union, I should say, works really closely with a church that um, like basically helps us like, st they're like a food bank and they will do like lots of drives among the teachers and um, staff and educators like within the different buildings and then all of the, the food bank um, supplies that we've raised go there and then they put it together and put like weekend bags together that then they bring back to our schools and we give them out to students so I mean for us that's like a huge thing is making sure we have enough donations making sure we have enough resources for our families but in Tacoma it's going to be really different and even in Tacoma because it's such a big district there's going to be like different needs within the different pockets of the community as well. Um, I used to teach at First Creek Middle School, um, which similarly was like a really high poverty area of the district. And so um, while we had like amazing, amazing resources from within our community, we also had some um, like needs that weren't always met. And so we had to think about like, how can we leverage what we have to get what we need and support our community, whereas there are going to be other pockets in Tacoma mm -hmm. where that's not a need in this at the same degree at all. So yeah, I would just say like, talk to the educators in your life, talk to your kids, teachers, and like, see how you can support them because it's going to be a different answer. Yeah, you can, it's just like any situation, you can never assume what somebody else's experience is like. So you just have to talk to people. And students too, because their experience, as Katie said, is different than the experience of teachers, but it's equally valid uh, when it comes to the learning environment. Yeah, and so many of those issues you bring up, I mean, those those affect our students at UWT. I mean, it's really, um, yeah, it's it's a real challenge, and it's like how you know, how do you how do you educate someone who who hasn't had something to eat in the last two days, or you know, is is sort of housing insecure? And those are Again, I mean, at least from my perspective, when I got into the profession, not not issues that I thought I would be dealing with, uh, but it becomes sort of increasingly more sort of central to how I imagine, uh, you know, the job in terms of what I do. Um, so I, I mean, I have so many more questions I could ask, and I do. I want to encourage the people who are sitting in to uh, to to send some questions into the chat board. I do know um, maybe while those creative juices get flowing, I know we've got some some people uh, taking this class who are potentially uh, thinking about entering the field, and so uh, of course the uh, <laughs> I feel like the ultimate meatball question for all interviews, like what what advice would you have for somebody uh, getting into education in in Washington State here in in 2020? The number one thing I always tell my students when they ask me this question is patience. And um, I think in some <laughs> cases, patience is not necessary. Like sometimes when working with administration and uh, the district office, and I think patience is the exact opposite of what you need. But when working with students, patience. And you have to repeat yourself and you have to repeat yourself more than you would like, but you say it in the same tone every time because it's it's just the nature of working with kids. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd say like, if you're thinking about being a teacher in Washington state, you're in like the best state to be a teacher. <laughs> like we have like a lot more pr protections and um, we have like a higher pay than um, a lot of other places. So, like Washington State is a great place to become a teacher compared to many other states, especially right now. Um, I guess I would say like, have the courage to say no. <laughs> like, especially Megan mentioned that like, you know, her first year she got asked to be a union rep and my first year I was too. And I also was like a soccer coach and I don't Me know things at all. <laughs> like, so, I mean, like, it was very interesting. <laughs> take that on um so I don't know I mean I guess like 
And also my first year of teaching, I was, I, I was at my building really late all the time. And like, so as like a mentor with like new teachers and with student teachers, like, um, I've just like tried to just say like, it's, a, it's okay to just do your best. And I, I think like with any profession that has to do with like creativity or is in any way like artistic, um, you know, like you have this like picture in your head of like what you want it to look like and what you want it to be like. And like, you are not performing that way, <laughs> like, especially in the beginning. And like, that for me was really hard because the difference between how I wanted to be performing and what I was capable of performing, like the skills that I had, um, was super frustrating. And so I ended up just kind of like telling myself like, oh, if I just pour more of my time in and pour myself in, of course it's gonna get better. And it didn't, it was just like more exhausting. So, I mean, you know, just like be gracious with yourself and don't be afraid to say no. And to just tell people like, it's my first year and I just wanna, or, you know, or my first couple of years, I just wanna like, work on my practice as a teacher. Um, and I mean, like the number one part of your job is, is your connections with students. Um, that's like more important than anything. It's more important than your evaluation. <laughs> it's more important than like having the most unique, mm -hmm. like lesson plan. Like the thing that matters most is your connection with your students and your mm -hmm. relationship with them. So if that's like, the number one thing that you focus on your like first year or like your first couple of years, like that's amazing. So everything else you'll, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so It's so funny you mentioned that there's uh, Ira Glass, the, uh, the host of yes. This American Life has I that, love that. <laughs> got that bit on uh, closing the gap, right? And it's like you get into education because like presumably you like being in, a, in an educational setting and you know what teaching looks like when it's done well, mm -hmm. but, but you also have the ability to judge your own performance and you can see that it's not quite where you thought it would be. And it's kind of, yeah. And then closing that gap is, it's a matter of, you know, I guess getting your reps in and just, you know, the experience of, of being in that setting. But I also like to the, I, I always tell my students who are interested in getting into the field to, uh, to think about teaching, it is an extremely creative field, uh, you know, because you are constantly just, you know, spinning gold out of, you know, hay, right? Yeah. In terms of coming up with new ideas and taking new approaches to old ideas. Um, so I think that's some really good advice. I do, uh, we've got, we've got a pretty small group and I do see we've got a hand up. So um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute J4 if you're there. Oh, they may have just put their hand down. Do you still have a question? Oh. Hey, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Um, so it's kind of a related question. Um, and this is something that I also kind of see with my own uh, past teachers as well. Um, I wanted to ask how you guys have dealt with um, educators burnout, you know? Um, like it's been explained a little bit in the reading that we had to do before the thing, but also just like um, on a more, I guess, emotional level as well. Because you guys not only have to deal with like administrators and fellow teachers but also students who you know you want to help but sometimes can't that's a great question it's a really good question um and it's a really hard one to answer because everybody deals with burnout in their own way and people are burnt out by different things um some people are burnt out by the emotional aspects some people are burnt out by the work aspects some people are burnt out by the the oversight issues with administration. So it really depends on your own uh, particular circumstances. But one thing I think 
you always have to keep in mind is, is the input going to be worth the output? So if I'm putting 48 hours into developing one lesson plan because I just want it to be this phenomenal learning experience for my students, sometimes you have to take a step back and really look at the material that you're trying to put together and think about what the learning experience might actually be like for students and then reconcile in your brain is it is it actually worth it is it worth killing myself over this lesson for it maybe to go well or maybe not um and i think also establishing and katie you got at a lot of this earlier but establishing clear boundaries for yourself um it's so easy and, and i've actually noticed this has been increased since the closure has happened where it doesn't really feel like there's any boundaries anymore and for the first couple of weeks i felt compelled to respond to emails even if i was getting them at eight o'clock at night because i didn't go home from work and kind of set all of that aside and i have my phone now set up to get notifications from all sorts of different platforms that we use and so um being able to to make those clear boundary so that you can protect your private life a little bit, I think is, is really valuable. Um, and above all, I'd say having some sort of support system at work is really valuable. And that can come from the union, of course. Um, but when in my first year at my new building, I would go days without speaking to another adult at work because <laughs> you just get so sucked into what you're doing. And when you're siloed into your own classroom, um, and overwhelmed by work and eating your lunch at your desk, it becomes really easy to just be totally consumed by it. And so having that support system, having somebody else look at you and say, I think you need to take a break or maybe you should set that down can be really valuable too. That's a, that's a great point. And, and something that people don't realize about teaching is that it can be a very isolating profession, mm -hmm. which ironically it's, uh, you know, you're, you're constantly surrounded by people all day. Uh, but but they're sort of interacting with the classroom in a very different way than you are. It's almost like being a like a toll booth operator. You know, it's like how can you be lonely? You're constantly you know seeing somebody every ten seconds, and it's like, well, no, it's not. Yeah, and it seems like when you are overwhelmed, um, you know, the the natural tendency is to bunker down, just grade the papers during lunch, and it's like th those, you know, uh, those sort of social connections are so important to prevent burnout. Yeah, I would second that. And I would say like, I also um, previously taught um, elective classes instead of, I have taught language arts, social studies, reading intervention, and like multiple different levels of like student leadership classes. And um, so when I've taught core content classes like language arts and social studies, I'm like working with the other teachers who teach that same content to write lessons and look at our data and then make adjustments to our lessons and like figure out different things. And I've also always been on like in every building I've worked in on like a department or a grade level team. And so you're you have like groups of people that you're like accountable to. Um, but most of your day is by yourself in your classroom unless you're intentional about um, like I couple of years back, like started forcing myself to eat lunch in the staff room. <laughs> and every single time I do that, it's always positive. Even if it's just me by myself, I will be in there by myself and staff members will come in to make coffees and we'll talk, you know. Um, but that's been so important to like set boundaries for myself on like, like during lunch, I I just connect with other people. I am an adult human being that's eating food. <laughs> um, I would also say that the years that I was teaching elective classes, that wasn't a core content and I didn't have a professional learning community or a PLC. I didn't have other teachers to talk to who were teaching the same subject as me. It was just me. I was the only person in the whole building that was even more important because then I was like, I wasn't beholden to meeting with a particular group of people every week or every couple of weeks or whatever. I could just teach whatever I wanted. And there's some freedom in that, which is really cool, but it can also be really isolating. So it like, like Megan said, I would totally agree. Like the most important like thing that you can do for burnout is to have like a really 
solid understanding of like the support system that you want to like put in place for yourself and like the people who understand your job the best are other teachers that you work with so eating lunch with them I also am like a huge proponent of going to happy hour <laughs> all the time like with my coworkers and like ah oh, like we just it's so helpful to just blow off steam together and you know drink together <laughs> and um yeah that's it's so helpful to do that i would also say like one thing that is like that i really want to share if you haven't heard about it already is the idea of like what is called secondary trauma and that is something that um is where if you are like working with groups of people who are experiencing trauma even if you're not encountering it firsthand at that time um if you're working with people who are experiencing trauma firsthand like you can um experience like a secondary version of that trauma and so it can feel really overwhelming and it can lead to burnout uh really quickly um and i would say like laura vandernoot lipsky uh wrote a book about secondary trauma which is amazing and i've had a chance to hear her talk a couple of times and like really trying to like understand that in yourself and trying to like read the signs of burnout and read the signs of secondary trauma are really important at least for me in my experience my um, partner is a social worker and he also experiences secondary trauma at times and so like we talk openly about that with each other and it's been huge for me and for him to be able to have that support with the other person like we're not like sharing the nitty gritty things that our clients or students or whatever are dealing with, but being able to just have someone that can relate to that, it has been really powerful and like really helpful. And, um, and also like, I don't know, like just making sure that you have other things in your life besides your job. <laughs> like it, I don't know, like teaching is one of those things. It's like, it's so, like, I find so much purpose out of my job. And so like for a lot of years, like that was like who I was, was a teacher. And like my hobby was being a teacher and like going to my students' performances and games and, you know, like leading clubs and like all of those things. Um, and that, that's really powerful to experience, but I'm like a better teacher when I'm a better taken care of human being. Like, so, um, if I'm making sure I'm doing like my hobbies and like one thing that's been really powerful for me personally is I try to exercise every day and meditate every day. And, um, those things really help me feel grounded, um, and just, uh, if you don't mind a little tangent, um, I lead the GSA at my school and which, um, in the past has been, uh, labeled the gender or the gay straight Alliance and like more modern term is gender sexuality Alliance. And, um, like my students in that group in particular have, been um, the most like depressed and dejected of all of the students I've been working with um, because for a lot of those students they are not open with their families about different aspects of their identity and so school has always been a safe place for them um, to be trying out like showing parts of their identity whereas at home they don't know how to do that yet and so um, yeah so like being able to being in contact with them during this time has been really like good. And is also like, I, when it, whenever we end our club meetings, I have to like go take care of myself because it's like really, it can be really emotionally exhausting. So that for me is like exercising, like doing some of my hobbies, like making sure I'm doing things that take care of me because, you know, like in, in an airplane you have to put your mask on first before you like put on somebody else's mask so i think that that that's capacity for empathy that that sort of makes people really strong teachers also sort of uh you know potentially subjects us to that kind of 
you know, secondary trauma, right? Because we sort of are so willing to kind of engage emotionally with people that, uh, you know, it puts us in a you know, potential space for victimization. Um, and I think too, you know, to, to go back with, to what Megan was saying before, um, you know, you can spend sort of an infinite amount of time fine tuning that one lesson, like teaching is one of those bottomless buckets of time if you if you choose to allow it to be so, right? And especially when, you know, we're working within a context where we're constantly having our work sort of second guessed and we're being told that we're not doing well enough. You know, the pressure is to just double down and spend more time at it, which, which you know, that's it's not healthy. And, and with the, you know, the pandemic, uh, having us all teaching from home at this point, yeah, the, the, the thin boundary, at least I used to have between work life balance is all but, you know, gone. Um, so we've got, we've got uh, another five, I, I don't see any more hands up. Um, so if we don't uh, have any more questions from the audience. And I'll give a second for people to think. I mean, I've got one more question, but I want to, you know, I don't want to monopolize the, uh, the microphone here. So is anybody else in the audience? I'll sort of slowly start asking it. And then if a hand comes up, I'll stop. Um, I'm kind of curious to know about sort of your, um, you know, your organizing work at, at, at a sort of, you know, how you sort of contextualize your sort of edu organizing work within sort of the larger organizing in your life. Um, and sort of how you, uh, how you see sort of the local, um, the local work that you do uh, within the context of sort of more national movements? Because I know you're both very politically active. Um, do you see this as sort of an extension of that, that part of your life or is this sort of a, a different side of your personality? I think it's absolutely a part of, it's all, it's all combined together. Um, it, it's, it's collective action, right? in in my with my students whenever they have an issue i try to help them organize around it and to so i teach uh an elective course that is all about um sort of personal development and a lot of the time they express concerns about things going on around the school so i teach them to be organizers and think about is this a widely felt issue is this a deeply felt issue who are the stakeholders in this uh around this issue what would be the process for actually um coming up with a solution we do power mapping and we look at who has power within the school and then we talk about um whether they have more power when they act alone or whether they have more power when they act together and if one of them writes a letter to the principal does she need to respond uh and what if the entire class wrote a letter together or what if an entire grade band wrote a letter together and just getting them to think about, um, yes, the power they have as individuals, but how that power is magnified when they act as a collective. And that's exactly the same when um, I'm operating in my capacity as a union member too. Thinking about, are these widely felt uh, issues? Are these deeply felt issues? Who has the power to change them? What would be not only the most effective way to come up with a solution, but what has the long term effect of creating more solidarity and ownership over the union so that people feel like um, They belong and that they have a role because so often people see uh, this is a slight tangent, but so often people see um, the union as something separate from themselves. And uh, my local is over a thousand people. And so when they say the union, they're typically talking about the representative council and the executive board. And so getting people to think differently and seeing themselves as the union and the people in their building as the union and operating as the union is really important. And then when we look at the world around us, it's all the same thing, right? Is this a widely felt issue? Is this a deeply felt issue? Who are the stakeholders? Who has the power to affect change here? And what is the, the strategic process for um, reaching that, that solution? Yeah, um, totally. I will say that like, just to kind of add on to what Megan said, because yes, a thousand percent of what Megan said, um, that I've also, um, have taught, like when I taught leadership, I did student government and ASB and um, 
and I'm doing that again this uh, fall as well. And like those have been really powerful vehicles for teaching like um, how to build influence as a leader. Um, and really I'm like teaching students how to have organizing conversations like all the time, which is um, really cool. And um, it like in my like previous years teaching leadership and student government, it was like my students um, looked at I had them like look at our school and like what were some of the issues going on and what are you know like if there are things that we can do anything about versus things we can't do anything about or things that are like out of our hands and then looking at the things we can do something about what can we do and they like came up with like a proposal and they had they like presented it to our admin and then presented it to our whole staff and then our staff like adopted this new like pbis um like model which is like behavior intervention system um so i mean like teaching is really cool because you get to um you get to really like help to develop like natural interests that students already have and i don't know like i i feel like i don't know like school is just like the most amazing place for students to develop their sense of like not only like who they are and like what their culture is, but also like empathy and like how to connect with other people. And like, I don't know, like this is also a little tangential, but I think school should really be less about teaching content because especially these days, like content is everywhere and students can access any information. It should really be about how do we, uh, like which content do we look at and how do we like rate which content make sense and matters and and more importantly like how do we connect with people and how do we communicate and how do we collaborate and how do we work together as like groups of human beings um and so no matter what i've been teaching that's been a huge focus on for me is like doing like group work and teaching students how to push through the like really awkward social dynamics that come up working in groups um so but yeah, like Alex said, like I am also really, uh, and I know Megan is too, like really, I try to be really politically active, like within my community. And um, I feel like, like, you know, like we've talked about before, like everything is political or everything is connected to education. And I personally feel like everything is inherently political, like, everything in our society comes back to some decision or some um, like resource that's available or not available. And why do certain people have those resources and why do certain people not have those resources? So um, I don't know, like I feel like uh, my skills as a teacher and trying to like support my students in how to make connections, um, I like to use those as much as possible to talk with my neighbors or um, to work with the different community groups that I'm a part of to uh, also have those good conversations. So. I want to address the question in the chat really quickly because I think it's really valid. Um, they asked if administration gets upset if we teach students to advocate when they're advocating against the administration. And that's part of the beauty of being a teacher sometimes is you're not pushing like most of the things that my students want to advocate for and that I hype them up about advocating for are things that I believe in too, but they're things that they came up with on their own. And I'm teaching them the skill, I'm not telling them what to do. And you cannot deny that a social studies teacher should not teach students how to advocate for the things that they believe in, because then what's the point, right? If they're not, <laughs> if they're not able to take those skills out into the real world, because that's what we're talking about, right? This is a constant state of organizing, whether you're a student or you're a worker or you're a community activist, you're in a constant state of building support for what you believe in. And um, especially as public schools start to push this idea of uh, what is our mission statement? It's like empowered and future ready, something like that. It's like, well, it looks like my students are empowered and future ready, so. It's hard to tell people not to do that. Yeah, we had a question come up, uh, submitted ahead of time about critical thinking and where that sort of exists within 
the curriculum now that is increasingly standardized and increasingly test based. And it's still, I mean, I've taught in, in schools that teach to the, you know, teaching to the test is what you have to do, but you, you, you kind of have to find your moments. And I think that again is, is sort of the beauty of the creative act of teaching is kind of, you know, doing your job, but then also doing the job that you feel like you should be doing, right? Um, well, this was absolutely delightful. Um, hopefully next year we can have you back. We'll get Eric Blanc back here and we could talk about local and national edgy organizing simultaneously. But I do, uh, I really just appreciate uh, you all giving us your time and your expertise and sharing your stories. And uh, I really think you know, this was this was a great seminar session. So thank you so much. If you've got a, a clap emoji, go ahead and throw it up there. Uh, <laughs> excellent. So uh, thanks again.